Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I think it's safe to do this now because we are socially distant. We are far away from everyone. We're following safety protocols. But I am here at Launch Complex 39A. This is at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I am standing right in front of SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule, riding on top of SpaceX's gorgeous Falcon 9 rocket. You know this rocket, it can land itself. It's flown like 85 times or something. It's just this reliable workhorse rocket that SpaceX has been flying for almost 10 years now. And I'm here because today is a really, really exciting day. NASA is sending Crew on top of a rocket for the first time in almost nine years, almost nine years exactly. The last crew that took off from this exact launch pad actually, from Launch Complex 39A, was STS-135. That was July 8th, 2011. And that was the last time the United States has put people into orbit. So this is a really big deal. Tomorrow, from right here, about 24 hours from right now, that rocket's going to take off and it's going to be sending Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley up into orbit and they're going to be sent off to the International Space Station. Now, if you need a timeline breakdown of all the events on launch day, all the way from suit up to orbit, I've already got you covered with a video. Now, if only there was someone that I could ask a couple more questions to because there's a lot of exciting stuff that I think a lot of us want answers to. Who could that be? I gotta stop doing that joke. You guys have read the title of the video. It's not like you'd don't know what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Ooh, what are Tim's gonna have on camera? Hey guys, hey. how's it going? Good, how are you? Fantastic. <laughs> okay, I've got a smorgasbord of stuff for you guys to set up. Um, Jim, if you can stand right over there along that. Oh, don't just shake your hand. But I, I know, it's sad, isn't it? Yeah, I'll just throw you a quick piece okay. on it. But right there is a, uh, is a mic. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind micing yourself up, that'd be fantastic. And Elon, if you wouldn't mind micing yourself up there too. Sure. That'd be great. And we're rolling on that, rolling here. Hi guys, congratulations. We are basically 24 hours away from seeing humans return to space from US soil, American <laughs> rockets, American soil. <laughs> You've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we've heard it and That's I think good. we're ready. So cool. um, I think the biggest thing I wanna, well, first off, congratulations to a big 2020 for you so far. You've had a kid. Oh yeah. <laughs> You've had, uh, a, you have a rocket out there on the pad waiting to have astronauts go to space for the first time. And, uh, and you're working on Starship simultaneously. You're still doing everything with Tesla. You're a very busy person. But I wanted to set a record straight, straight off the bat. I want people to hear from both of you sure. the beautiful partnership of NASA and SpaceX and how far back it goes and that it's not NASA versus SpaceX. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Elon, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us the history of how SpaceX and NASA started working together in the first place. Sure. Well. Um... I mean, this, this actually could be quite a long story, but basically the, the whole reason I started SpaceX was actually to try to increase NASA's budget. Um, or at least the way I, I got interested in space was uh, I was trying to figure out why we had not gone to Mars. And, and then I, th I thought, well, uh, maybe it's, it, we need to reignite public excitement in Mars. So I initially started off uh, with the idea of doing this like philanthropic mission to send a small greenhouse to Mars yep. um, to get the public excited about uh, sending life to Mars, yeah. Um, and if we got the public excited, then they would tell their representatives in Congress uh, and to increase NASA's budget. <laughs> that was the goal. But I was no actual. It was meant to be a philanthropic thing. Yeah. Um, and then I try, I, I try to buy some ICBMs in Russia to do this, and ultimately came to the conclusion that and, and that there's actually plenty of will to to go beyond Earth, but there needs to be a way. Like mm -hmm. essentially, NASA needs to have um, uh, you know more affordable rockets that we need to increase the pace of innovation uh, in space. And so if we can give NASA another horse in the stable um, that, that is moving faster uh, and, and cost less and more innovative, then that would be a way to accelerate progress in space. So I, I, I love NASA and always have and always will. Yeah, yeah, and Jim, you, you weren't with NASA at the beginning of the, the COTS program and stuff like that or even the, yeah, the commercial resupply, but you've been around for a while to see the, the kind of the cherry get on the top here with That's the right. crew program actually coming together. So tell us about like what you've seen so far and how you've seen the commercial partners really uh, step up to the plate. Yeah, so SpaceX brings a very unique capability to the mix that NASA has been lacking, quite frankly. SpaceX is really good at flying and testing, even being willing to fail and then fix and then fly, test, fail, fix. Um, and, it, and, and, and they can reiterate that over and over again very, very fast. And we've seen that with Starship now. Um, the, the willingness to fail is something that NASA has lacked for a very long time. 
but it's what enables SpaceX to move so fast, to rapidly iterate and improve. Um, you know, NASA has this history of qualifying every component, and then every subcomponent, and then every, you know, the, the, every, every piece of every rocket is fully qualified, and everything has to go perfect on every launch. Um, and that, that slows us down. And uh, SpaceX has been a great partner. Make no mistake, they have pushed NASA. But I hope NASA has, has also come along and, and pushed them in a way that is unique as well. So um, this partnership has been fantastic. Uh, and, and you're seeing the fruits of it. Uh, we'll see it tomorrow for sure. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's no question that, NASA, that, that SpaceX would, would not be where it is today without NASA. As, as the saying goes, we're only here because we stand upon the shoulders of giants. Yeah, and then you're wearing stilts on top of that, I feel. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's a high bar. <laughs> sure. I mean, we're inside the actual firing room here. This yeah. is where the, and you guys flipped it the right way, so everyone's looking out the yeah. window. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's like the, the biggest change. Uh, you know, we modernized some of the decor, but most importantly, we flipped the, the, the screen so you can, everyone can look out that yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, but the, this, the, this glass that's, that's been here since the 60s, um, you can see it in the, in the, like the Apollo you know, movie, like the documentaries and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the same, it's the same glass, same angle. It's been here since the 60s, actually. It's kind of, it was kind of modern looking. Yeah, no, it's yeah. gorgeous. This glass yeah, has seen so, a lot of history. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what an awesome view. Seriously. Oh, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> like, wow. So, I mean, that's got to just be the biggest honor for, you know, SpaceX leased that pad in 2014. I was actually, that was the first mission was CRS-3 for me. Yeah. And Gwen was out here to, to lease the pad. Yeah. And I remember it being a big deal. You know, 39A, that's it's the It's like Times Square. Launch, yes. It's, it's like open, how, open, opening a play on Times Square. This is the best location. Yes. Best, and best launch pad in the world. Definitely. By yeah. far. I mean, yeah. and obviously for those uh, listening, this is where the people going to the moon, every single one of them walked up. I uh, went up that tower, well, a slightly different tower, but, but out there on that pad, went to the moon, like 80-something space shuttle missions took off from 39A. I it's, mean, it's a great honor that, that, uh, that SpaceX is allowed to use that, that there's, pad. There's a lot yeah. of history there, yeah. and, and we're still writing the history. The history yeah. is going to be written tomorrow yet again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell me a little I'm bit. I'm trying to. Yeah. yeah. No, you're in the super most <laughs> awkward <laughs> position. This is going to be the most YouTube <laughs> interview ever, but, yeah. you know, we're rolling with it. Yeah. So, but one of the fun things for me is watching the, the, the cargo go into the crew vessel. You know, all of a sudden we had Dragon 1. Now we have Crew Dragon. And it's, it's substantially different, but, but familiar. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like, what's been some of the hardest parts to transition from cargo into crew? Because crew is a little more important than, <laughs> than cargo. Yes, I mean, cargo can be replaced, crew cannot. Um, right. And so the, the level of scrutiny, the level of attention is, I mean, I don't know, order of magnitude greater. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was already high for cargo. I mean, we're, and, and, uh, but it's, it's just a whole nother level for, for crew. Um, so, you know, and I, I told the, the, spa the SpaceX team that, you know, the, uh, this mission reliability is not merely the top priority, it is the only priority right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just doing continuous uh, uh, engineering reviews uh, from now, nonstop, uh, 24 hours a day until launch. Just yeah. going over everything again and again wow. and again. And I was out at the pad just recently, just walking down the rocket. Um, we, we've, you know, we've got a team that's just crawling over the rocket in the horizontal. Then we're going to rotate it vertical. Then we're going to crawl all over in the vertical. And um, we're just looking for any, any possible action that can improve the probability of success, no matter how small. Whether that comes from an intern or me or anyone, it right. doesn't matter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And this is just the beginning of, I mean, we're seeing a lot of new things come out between w uh, partnerships with SpaceX and NASA. I think yes. the one, there's it's been, been a some great partnership. Like I said, I love NASA. I, I literally had I love NASA as my password. Technically, <laughs> it was I love NASA nine exclamation mark. Because <laughs> it would be too easy to guess otherwise. Was the nine because of nine Merlin engines? Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, it was. Nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, so I want to know, you, you guys have dropped some surprises on us. Just in the past couple of months, we have Dragon XL flying on Falcon Heavy for Gateway. That, I didn't see that coming at all. Um, tell, what, what is Dragon XL? What's, what's its heritage? What is it? What is it? Well, I think probably we want to limit this uh, you know, interview to what's happening tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then we can talk about other stuff later. But we, we, okay. I always love talking to you, so yeah. it's like, you know, we do it, but, but we're going to stay. We've got to stay on. This, okay. the, like when I said this is the only priority, this is the only priority. Nice. So other yeah. stuff is nice. Yeah, yeah. This is the priority. Yeah. What, what I will tell you, and I think this is important, um, 
this relationship between SpaceX and NASA has been sufficiently meaningful to where we, we are now looking at, at how we do all of our business models. Mm -hmm. And that includes how we're going to resupply the gateway. Um, it includes how we're going to get to the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. This business model has proven to be very effective, first on commercial resupply, now on commercial crew. I will let SpaceX and Elon Musk talk all day long about what the details entail, but, but, and obviously he's not ready to talk about that today, but I, but I will tell you that the relationship um, has proven to be tremendously valuable and that the business model has proven to be tremendously valuable. Yeah, well, I mean, because NASA basically got a Falcon 9 and a Dragon capsule for initial investment of $400 million. Right. Yeah, nobody thought that would work, basically. No. I think, that, yeah. That yeah. was, that's that, 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 was that, that, that was not expected. That was like, I think at the time viewed as like a maverick thing <laughs> that, you know, to basically, to some degree, at least by the con a lot of the conventional uh, p people was like, oh, that's, let's just, you know, give the, those commercial guys some money to be quiet and then, you know, <laughs> Then, then they can stop bugging us, basically. Well, it was definitely and, a Hail Mary. Yeah, yeah, it was a Hail Mary. A, a commercial yeah. partner launching a, an orbital class rocket. I mean, rendezvousing with the International yeah, Space yeah. Station, it was already Absolutely. just this huge, long checklist of, okay, sure, yeah, you have to do that. Okay, they'll have to do that, too. And, and now yeah. we're just seeing the next iteration of that. We're seeing it to the point of being, you know, replacing the shuttle's, you know, importance of, of carrying humans on top of it. I mean, that's, like, yeah. the ultimate thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the... Because the, the flag has been up there since 2011. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if all goes well, Dragon will recover the flag that was last placed there by the space, the space shuttle yeah. about, uh, nine years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Doug was on that mission, Doug Hurley. So he, did he actually put the flag up there? Like, it'd be pretty cool. I'm not sure, it, but... It would be pretty cool. I mean, there's a certain poetry to this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> it really, so there a, really is. Um, and the same launch pad. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is kind of coming full circle. So. Yeah. What do you guys think as far as looking forward? I mean, you, we have next up already, you already have another crew launch on the docket. I mean, and, right. it, and it's been expanded from three people to four. This mission's expanded from a two week mission to a month plus? Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure if the, if the final amount of time has been decided. Do you know, do you know it, what it is? No, it's, it's very flexible on the yeah. back end, I'll say that. So we wanna make sure that crew one is ready to go. Um, we have a target date for that at the end of August. Um, and between now and then, um, if crew one is ready to go, uh, Bob and Doug, we're going to bring them home. Um, if we need to extend them a little bit, we'll extend them a little bit. Uh, we want to get as much out of the International Space Station as we can. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's what we intend to do. But the big, the big three factors, when we think about the flexibility on the back end of this mission, the big three fac factors are the solar arrays, which for this mission have about 114 day lifespan. Although we will learn on we'll learn. orbit. Yeah, we'll, we'll, exactly. There's it, a lot to be learned. Uh, so. it, it, they could last longer. We yeah. don't know yet. But we're, we're assuming 114 days at this point. Um, and then, of course, the weather and the readiness yeah. of Crew-1. And I think if all goes well, um, I, I've been really clear with everybody on the NASA side, our number one priority is to get this thing tested and to get Bob and Doug home safely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's the highest priority. Yes. I would also like to say, you, you mentioned that this is the replacement for the shuttle. Um, I really think that that's, that's, a gr that's a gross understatement. We are transforming in a very historical nature how we access space mm -hmm. in general, where NASA is a customer, one customer of many. And we expect SpaceX, as you know, to go get lots of customers that are not us. Yeah. Um, and, and that's gonna drive down our costs. And, and we wanna have not just SpaceX, but other providers that are competitive on cost, on innovation, on safety basically creating this robust marketplace in space. And then we're using, the ISS right now is being used to create the commercial markets of the future for microgravity, whether it's pharmaceuticals, immunizations, printing of human organs in 3D, advanced materials, artificial retinas. I mean, there's so many things that we're proving out on the ISS right now. Um, and if, we, if, if NASA accomplishes its objectives, we're not just going to have commercial resupply and commercial crew. We're going to have commercial space stations. We're going to be landing on the moon commercially. So there, this, is, this, is, this is the shuttle replacement. That's not what this is. This is a transformation of how we do commercial space in general. Yeah. I mean, this, I'm not sure if the public is actually aware that there's a giant space station zooming around Earth. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think probably a lot of people don't know that this is the case. Yeah. Um, and it's enormous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's an enormous space station zooming around the Earth 25 times the speed of sound, circling the globe every 90 minutes. Yeah. 
Uh, can you see the pictures? It looks like it's stationary. Right. And it, it, it does have station in the name. Right. But it's right. it's extremely fast. It's a, it's it's going. It's I mean, it's going. You know, like I don't. Know, Seventeen thousand five hundred mile an hour, twenty-seven thousand kilometers. It's screaming. Yeah. It's screaming. <laughs> I, I mean, or, order of magnitude faster than a bullet, basically. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's that. It's so funny because there's been a permanent presence on the International Space Station too for what twenty years or something now. I mean, it's it's yeah. been a, a huge part of of the science and the exploration of of NASA currently, and it's fun to be able to see now with new offerings. We'll be able to get to the International Space Station cheaper, mm -hmm. and, and NASA will continue to push and go back into deep space, which I think is a really cool way to transition into the future. So yeah, um, but as as the administrator was saying, the the. But, you know, this is, hope, I mean, this is really, we want this to be the dawn of a new era uh, where there's a rapid, a rapid increase in innovation, um, where we're sending more and more people to orbit, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we're sending, um, you know, both government and commercial uh, passengers to orbit, uh, astronauts to orbit, and uh, generally opening up space for humanity. Um, you know, the ultimate goal being that anyone who wants to go uh, to orbit or, or the moon or maybe even Mars can go. It's it's like, if if you if you want to move there, you can. Mm -hmm. Like that's the ultimate goal. That, so, but then how does that handoff kind of look? Because you know, if, if commercialization opens up and NASA is kind of the current gatekeeper, so to speak, a little bit, how does that transition is going to kind of be a little bit of a, a a gray area for a little bit? You know, like if Tom Cruise going to the International Space Station, like how is who has the authority to say what goes on and all that stuff currently when commercial partners are the ones selling the ride well, well, yeah. that, that's obviously. yeah right well, well, <laughs> yeah. For, for, remember for now right and and look nasa we have a job exploration discovery science inspiration that's our job um, but there's a whole nother element of space which is development and that's what commercial industry does commercial industry does development mm -hmm. so when we think about you know, when people came to the New World and then they expanded west, right? Um, they expanded west with a purpose. They were seeking commerce. The railroad got put into place for a purpose. It was put, it was put there for commercial reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we are right now at the dawn of this new era in spaceflight. Ultimately, if the government is the only one doing things in space, it will not be sustainable, it will not be successful. There has to be a commercial motive to achieve the objectives that we all hope for. Yeah, yeah, and we're literally seeing that. Like this is this is it. This is the dawn of that new era. It yes. is, and that's. I mean, what history in the making? I just. I'm so excited that that everyone, the public, is finally seeing this. I'm seeing this everywhere. You know, I mean, SpaceX has had some big missions recently. NASA's had some big missions recently, but this is this is the one. And that's right. I, I am so excited to be here. Um, I'm very. Unf it's unfortunate a lot of the press and public aren't able to have the. Yeah. You know, considering the circumstances, but it's so cool that we live in an era where we can bring this to everyone and everyone can get excited and, and have something forward to look, you know, something to look forward to instead yes, of exactly. the current state of the, of the world. So Yeah, I, mean, I really hope this is something that, uh, like, everyone, no matter what their political leanings are, however they feel, can be excited. They can look at this and be excited about the future. Yeah. That's exactly right. Like, th this is a, a bright, shiny moment in a, in a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And we've had these in the past, and this is what NASA has been historically, a, a, you know, a, a, a signal of hope in a time of troubled uh, circumstances. And of course, we think back to the 1960s, we think about Vietnam, we think about the protests, we think about the civil rights abuses, we think about the civil rights protests, the, the country in turmoil, and yet in 1968, we sent astronauts around the moon. In 1969, we landed on the moon. That was, that was probably one of the most difficult times in American history, and yet we still achieve these magnificent things. And here we are in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, and we can still do magnific magnificent, magnificent things. Mm -hmm. And that's what, uh, that's what tomorrow represents. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys for taking some time with me. Uh, best of luck tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. We're all gonna be tuning in. I'm telling you, the public is extremely excited. So Great. thank you guys for everything. I'm gonna have to just throw you guys a peace sign and say thank you, but- uh, All right. Yeah, all right, uh, thanks guys. Thank you, right. yeah, appreciate we'll you. you. Let me apologize, if you saw this in my ear, it's not because I have a producer. I just had my friend Trevor Malman helping me shoot this, and that's it, that was it. There's all, there's CBS and CNN with all their big fancy cameras and stuff, and then there's just me. And I only brought two microphones because I didn't know Jim Bridenstine was gonna join us, which was a huge surprise. So it ended up being like, I'm like, I'll give them the good mic. So if my audio sucks, I apologize. You're hearing iPhone headphones to the rescue. So I guess that's the joy of being a YouTuber.
Well, uh, that exceeded quite literally every expectation I've ever had in life. I was just right there in firing room number four, which is literally where they commanded the Apollo missions and told the rocket that took humans to go to the moon to launch. Right there, I was there. What just happened? Um, you should watch the Apollo 11 film, the CNN Films documentary on Apollo 11 that just came out last year for the 50th anniversary. You get to see a lot of shots from that particular room. It was stuffed to the brim with computers and it was facing the wrong way where people were not looking out the window. And uh, it's just being in there right now, I'm like totally beside myself. Wow, what an awesome day. And tomorrow is going to be even cooler. And honestly, I couldn't do it if it wasn't for the help of my Patreon supporters. So if you want to help me continue to do what I do and make awesome content about rockets and space flight, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut where you'll gain access to our exclusive subreddit, our exclusive Discord channel, and exclusive live streams. And if you want to wear some really cool shirts, including a shirt where Elon's, after we shut off the camera, was like, uh, you have Arcadia Planitia on your shirt? I'm like, yeah, that's your prime candidate landing site for Starship with the exact coordinates. And he just fucking was like, that's awesome. So yeah, if you want your own Future Martian Society shirt and some reminders of the gravity and atmosphere on Mars, uh, and also a reminder not to, you know, forget to wear a spacesuit if you're on Mars. Or if you want any other cool shirt like the Full Flow Stage Combustion Cycle shirt or Pointy End Up, Flamey End Down, we got lots of cool nerdy space stuff for you at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.